money is bad. At this point, it's fairly common to hear someone from the younger generations lambase and lament capitalism. We can attribute many of the world's problems to capitalism. Hell, we can even attribute stubbing our toes on hostile architecture to capitalism. Vague anti-capitalism is the wave these days. Here's the kicker though. Vague anti-capitalism is not an ideology. In fact, you can go in many different directions if you end up entering the equally vague left. I've made it clear before, but I'll say it again. I don't think the term left is very useful as it describes a wide variety of mutually oppositional movements and ideologies. But anyway, the intentionally provocative title gives it away, of course. The way I see it, capitalism is hardly disrupted by vague anti-capitalism. Rather, vague anti-capitalism often serves to maintain it. Let me explain. In Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism, Is There No Alternative? He posits the term capitalist realism to describe the current global political situation, where alternatives to the capitalist system remain invisible to the mainstream, and people find it impossible even to imagine a coherent alternative to it. The book was written in 2009, before the wave of social democrats swept into office in the US and shifted the national conversation somewhat. Need I remind you, however, that social democracy is still capitalism, so the point still stands. They have managed to destigmatize the word socialism, but they've also managed to conflate socialism with a nicer capitalism in the minds of millions. The title is a play on the quote by neoliberal ghoul Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative as well as the concepts attributed to either Frederick Jameson or Slavoj Žižek, which states that it is easier to imagine an end of the world than an end to capitalism. Throughout the short book, Fisher critiques neoliberalism and its impact on pop culture, work, education, and mental health. It's important to note that capitalist realism never asserts that capitalism is a perfect system. Rather, it relies on the absurd human nature argument, which I and others have already dismantled thoroughly. It asserts that it is the only system that is compatible with human desire and economic law. That no system could operate without a basis on the private accumulation and hoarding of wealth and capital. And at this point, you're probably thinking, yeah, yeah, we know all that. Capitalism bad, pure ideology. We were born with a copy of Althusser. I boss, man. So let me talk about where anti-capitalism fits in all this then. Particularly in media and in movements. Anti-capitalism in media. While I still strongly believe we should abolish Disney and balkanize the animation industry, I had to say, Disney Pixar presented an absolute banger with Wally. -E. Remember when the robots fell in love? Real tears, man. Anyway, I'm sure y'all can come up with more examples in the comments, but Wally -E works to illustrate my point. And don't worry, I'm not going to become another media critique YouTuber. Wally -E is a critique of consumerism, not capitalism. Of course, consumerism is a manifestation of capitalism, but you'll notice that even as Wally -E pans over cities of garbage and barren landscapes, even as it negatively portrays the worst excesses of corporate malpractice and automated dystopia, it fails to truly point to capitalism's foundational flaws as the source of Earth's demise. In fact, even post-apocalypse, the corporate monopoly of by and large endures. The mega corporation destroyed the planet and took its customers with it to space, where they regressed into beings of pure consumption. The fatness-laziness metaphor is problematically very prominent. Sure, the humans eventually stand up to the corporate AI overlord, quite literally, but the film sees to place the blame of consumerism on the people, while the corporation was simply doing what it had to do. The film basically says that it's these blobs' fault for not looking up from their gadgets and gulpers to go green and save the turtles. It doesn't really say that they should have overthrown capitalism, just that they should have changed their lifestyles. Because when the global leader slash BNL CEO spins the existential crisis as a luxury cruise, it seems they barely bat an eye and go right back to consuming. I'm not saying this is the only valid interpretation of the film, but it's one to consider. In fact, with the release of the movie, the then billion dollar Disney was pumping out plastic merchandise made with sweatshop labor. Over the years since then, Disney has expanded to consume more and more retailers, TV stations, streaming services, and brands. The multi-trillionaire conglomerate may have made you cry over robots and question your plastic straw purchases, but they're quite fine destroying the earth for profit. They don't see the vague anti-consumerism or vague anti-capitalism in their content as a meaningful threat to their interests. If there's a market for anti-capitalism, capitalists will sell it to you, leaving you feeling like you've performed anti-capitalism without contributing anything but profits. Media consumption is not activism. 
If anything, what Wally demonstrates is that, contrary to the popular notion that communism is basically inevitable, capitalism can warp and transform itself in ways we can't even predict. It seems ever ready to improvise, adapt, and overcome. So I've briefly touched on how anti-capitalism manifests in mainstream media. But what about anti-capitalism on YouTube? Years after the wave of anti-SJW and alt-right YouTubers were countered by the rise of various left personalities, it seems to me that certain patterns and behaviours among left tube remain, despite the serious need for us to push further. I'm not saying that any particular left tube personality is bad or that they're meant to lead the revolution, but I think we should confront the reality that many of these personalities, while anti-capitalist in name, have done little to push people towards solutions, and particularly solutions outside of electoralism. It seems easier to react to Jordan Peterson or Steven Crowder as if their relevance hasn't waned since 2016, or take down another garbage PragerU video. But with such massive platforms, they could do a whole lot more than just feed into vague anti-capitalism, critiquing what is for the 10th time, and instead push towards exploring and sowing the seeds of what could be. They could guide people towards building meaningful, concrete political programs, beyond the empty platitudes. Instead of spending 90% of the discourse talking about politicians, celebrities, and drama for the clicks and views. All that wasted energy, talking about the same problems again and again without talking real strategy, just leaves people overwhelmed and demobilized. But I'll wrap this up in the conclusion. On to my next point. Let's talk about anti-capitalism in activism. Vague anti-capitalism is a very prevalent sentiment in progressive organizing spaces, no matter the movement. There's an area protest on the street these days that doesn't have at least one sign boost calling out capitalism, or at least particular corporations. But the very active protest has been, to a significant extent, co-opted. Thanks to the efforts of the media, non-violence activists, and NGOs, protests have become naught but a gesture of resistance, without any actual muscle to back it up. The rinse-repeat cycle of protest, tear gas, arrest, bail fund needs to be broken. It's about time these resources and efforts were poured into enduring, powerful movements that operate outside of the mainstream liberal solutions of demanding reform or demanding abolition. Demanding abolition will never manifest it. Abolition must be part of a militant political program, else it be co-opted again and again. The state will never abolish itself. Your continued investment in it will only serve to keep it chugging. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. These vaguely anti-capitalist movements can't continue to put so much effort into a strategy that leads to inconsequential reforms or utter defeat, slowly inching towards mitigating some aspects of capitalism when you can go much further is basically an act of self-sabotage, which lends itself to my thesis. The prevalence of passive, vague anti-capitalism, while better than nothing, stabilized some acceptance on the inevitability of capitalism. It seems that many, even on the so-called left, have resigned themselves to their fate of the endurance of capitalism, not out of apathy or cynicism, but out of reflexive impotence. They know things are bad, but more than that, they know they can't do anything about it. That knowledge is not a passive observation of an already existing state of affairs. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you know you can't do anything, you won't. But folks don't get that it's not enough to consciously object to capitalism. You have to fight it materially, with strategies that work. The 2008 financial crisis and the disorganized 2011 Occupy movement had the potential to create real revolutionary change, if only the pieces were in place to mobilize. All they did, however, was compound capitalist realism. They didn't shake the foundation. In fact, the crisis reinforced the notion of merely modifying capitalism rather than dismantling it completely. We're now in the midst of a global crisis of crises. As the vaccine apartheid builds and the climate crisis intensifies, we can't afford to fall into the same traps again. So what's the alternative? Vague anti-capitalism is passive and pacifying. To overcome the impotence it generates, it is necessary to ground yourself in the principles of true liberation and anchor yourself in a collaborative, comprehensive political project attuned to your local material conditions. Free from the domination of leaders and the constraints of politicians, working with a goal in mind, develop strategies that will push you towards success. Start preparing for the next crises. Attune yourself to the successes and failures of past movements, and be ready to root out capitalist apologia, capitulation, and cooptation tactics. Reject systems of domination wholly. 
or they will consume you. And by the way, this isn't a call out for folks new to the fight for anarchism, abolition, liberation, land back, social ecology, and all that jazz. I've low-key been calling myself out through this video, so you're not alone. I just want to encourage us to go further than we have been, to learn what needs to be learned so we can hit the ground running. My content has largely been geared towards supplementing political projects, but I want to make sure you all are pushing beyond me. Read, connect, and start building. Whether you're on the streets pushing mutual aid groups beyond charity work and donations, researching, coordinating, and raising funds from home, or in the dirt, reaching people through perma blitzes, I want all you to be working towards a vision. Our visions won't all be the same, but as long as they're compatible, I can picture a world in which many worlds exist. We've got some difficult days ahead, but I'm still headed to the promised land. Take breaks when you need to, fam. I hope you're with me to the end. Peace. Thank you for watching. Thanks once again to the family, on grad, Kobe Tamayo, John Vechi, Orishimoni, Len P, Sungai, Seth, J. Dorrance, Ipa, Wyatt, Beyond the Binary Podcast, Mamish Disgustin, Eshi the Mad, Boy, Jeff Massey, Kimonoko, Alki, Forrest Alvarez, Poodle Hawk, Joaquin Club Norman, Spencer Harmon, Matt, and Suavocado Jones. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash saint true. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. Be the algorithm. Check out my previous videos for the fascinating topics. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore saint true. Thanks again. Peace.